Aloha. Welcome to Maui Eva TV. This is our 14th episode, and we welcome you to watch the previous episodes on YouTube channel. Today, I'm very pleased to have not one, not two, but three guest speakers on this show. First, I'll be introducing Doug Teeple from the Big Island. Next, John Gartner from Navigant Research from Colorado. And finally, Ethan Elkind from California, UC Berkeley School of Law. We'll be talking about electric vehicles in the past, the present, the infrastructure that's needed, and also a new report and another new report that's about to be released. Please stay with us and come right back and we'll begin with Mr. Teeple, the founder and president of the Big Island EV Association. Welcome back to Maui EVA TV, or Maui Electric Vehicle Alliance, a project of the UH Maui College. Very pleased today to have a special guest from the Big Island, uh, not just any guest, but the founder of the Big Island Electric Vehicle Association, Mr. Doug Teeple. Doug, welcome to our show. Thank you, Anne. How does it feel to, to fly into Maui yesterday for our EV forum in the evening and then barely catching a night of sleep and then jetting, uh, driving up here? Great. It's a kind of a whirlwind tour. A whirlwind tour. But it's fun. And you've got um, the first leaf that's been rented on Maui from Bio Beetle, the maroon leaf. Is that right? You're yes, rent I rented a leaf. You rented a leaf. Charged it at the hotel last night. And everything's fine. Works great. Great, wonderful. I want to know, what made you decide to start the EV Association on the Big Island? Did you see a need, or was it simply you wanted to meet other electric vehicle drivers? Well, I got my leaf in 2011, and the first thing I noticed was... Uh, lack of infrastructure on the island and I knew people were struggling so uh, I thought the best way uh, to help people out with their with their electric cars is to form a group that would communicate about ordinary things like where the charge stations are whether they're working mm -hmm. and this kind of thing so we uh, it's a very active group mm -hmm. uh, it's grown to 70 members in two years 70 members and are most of them Leaf or Chevy Volt drivers? I would imagine on the Big Island there would be a lot of Volts. Most of them are Leafs. Most of them are Leafs. Yep. And, and a few Volts and a few Teslas. A few Teslas, right. So the Leafs, now, can they charge? Is, is there a fast charger on the Big Island? Unfortunately, we don't have any fast chargers at all. So how do they get around? Well, that's the problem I'd like to talk with you about today. All right, but go, before you start your presentation, um, I just want to ask, do you have charging at home? Yes. Level if, two? Level two. Okay, so you can charge at home. Yeah. How about at work? No. Okay, but do you need a charger at work? You live close to? I walk to work. You walk to work, okay. Yeah. Every, okay. every um, member that I know has a level two charger in the garage. Ev okay. Right. So, it's and most of them have uh, photovoltaic, too. Most of them have PV on their roofs, right? Well, we noticed there's a high correlation, very, very high. California found it was 39% the link between PV and EV. 
Probably on the Big Island, it's 100%. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, um, yeah. W would you like to start your presentation? Sure. Through? Okay. Sure. So my presentation is about the need for uh, level three charge station infrastructure mm -hmm. on the Big Island. Uh, our organization uh, has uh, now 70 members. Mm -hmm. And there are, I believe, 93 registered electric vehicles on the Big Island, 60 of which are LEAFs. Uh, we're a very active group, well-connected, uh, and we have associations with uh, the Maui Evi Our Alliance, yes. Yep, and Plug in America and the Electric Auto Association. The uh, issue, though, is that we're hampered by a lack of infrastructure on the Big Island. Why build out infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Well, depending on who you, you talk to, uh, there's between a two and five billion dollar a year outflow of money from Hawaii for the purchase of gas and oil. Some people say that Hawaii's biggest export is money. <laughs> and I know people on the Big Island that are spending between two and three hundred dollars a month for gas. Now you say that and I'm not surprised because on Maui that's almost typical. I right. have colleagues that spend that and when we were on Molokai it was like yeah two three hundred dollars. Nobody even blinks an eye. They accept it. Is this not normal for the rest of the U.S.? People are hurting. Uh, what we like to do is show them that they don't just have to spend the money, that there's an alternative. So expenditures for oil kind of dwarfs food consumption. And if you are interested in sustainability, then the huge amount of energy that's available to everyone here in Hawaii can be used rather than importing external sources. That is sources. one of the paradoxes of paradise, I think. Anybody who comes here will see we have plenty of sunshine every single day a lot of wind yeah trade wind and on the big island you have geothermal right and water yep. hydro right right and what else a lot of other <laughs> but you you're also you also are the biggest island mm -hmm. in the chain mm -hmm. um, and population uh, the big island is actually second in population of the islands uh, of course uh, Oahu and Honolulu is the biggest, but uh, the Big Island has 193,000 people, and Hilo is the third largest city in the islands. So we have a, a sizable population, mm -hmm. but practically no infrastructure. No DC fast charger. At and all. I presume not enough level two charging stations. Yeah, I can talk about okay. that. Okay. We, uh, so echo tourism is booming on the Big Island. Huge number of people come into the island, but you can't rent an electric car there. So they drive around in these gas, gas guzzlers cars. looking right. at. So, and uh, we're in a you, kind of a unique situation that we have two Nissan dealerships, neither of which will sell Leafs. So where do you get your Leafs? The 60 Leafs that we have on the Big Island all came from somewhere else. Amazing. Yeah. And... Uh, for service, uh, the local uh, Nissan dealer here in Maui has to fly his technician mm -hmm. over to the Big Island to do service on our Leafs. And of course, that's part of where my organization is very helpful because we originally arranged for the service to be done and mm -hmm. our network gets mm -hmm. everybody lined up. So the, the technician lands in Hilo, does a bunch of cars, comes up to Waimea, does a bunch of cars, ends up in Kona does a bunch of cars and heads back to Maui. Right. So I understand that um, ever since we met in February when Ethan and I came over and visited the Big Island, um, one of your missions is to do outreach and let not just locally but the state and the world know that you need better infrastructure. Right. Because there is a demand for electric vehicles. The demand is there. The, the people that are buying Leafs in spite of all the obstacles is amazing. It's amazing. If those obstacles were removed, you know, 
Mm -hmm. see it take and, off. and this is why you're doing this year's National Plug-in Day event in That's Hawaii. Right. Last year we did it on Maui. The previous year it was Oahu. This year is on the Big Island. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, the, um, we're hosting two events. Mm -hmm. One in Hilo on September 28th mm -hmm. at the Home Depot. And in Kona, at Kona Commons, um, on the 29th, Sunday. And both those events are from 10 to 2. Wonderful. So we've invited uh, all the press. Um, actually, the two days before that I came here, I mm -hmm. had two interviews. Excellent. Uh, so it's been very busy. I think this is great because we truly believe that you have to see it, talk to people that yeah. drive it, own it, and experience the test drive and also experience the charging of it. Yeah, and we really believe not just for five minutes, ten minutes, but preferably if you could rent one. Can you rent an EV on the Big Island? No. What a, what a pity. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> so, so you have these charge stations at hotels, is that right? But yeah. then you can't rent an EV. Right. <laughs> so how does this make any sense at all? Right. What happened was there, there was a, a, gov a federal government grant that put in a lot of charge stations mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Throughout the ARA the funding, yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, uh, almost all of that money was spent in Honolulu. Yeah, I and do. they have four DC fast chargers. Kauai has one. We managed to get one. We have zero. You have zero. That it was not evenly distributed. We were completely overlooked. Yeah. We only got uh, originally eight charge stations, and they put level them in two. The level two. Uh -huh. And they put them in the strangest place in the hotels up and down the Kohala coast. Right. And in Hilo, you can't drive from Kona to Hilo. Okay. Right. So how do you get there? How do you get there? And all the charge stations are are put. 10 miles from one another up and down the coast. And people who drive EVs don't go to hotels. They <sighs> go to uh, destinations. Well, I understand there was a deadline before the funding would run out. So probably those were the easiest to put in. If a hotel... Right. Yeah. It was low-hanging fruit. Low-hanging fruit, right. Yeah. So, you know, better place put them in, and we're grateful for them, because mm -hmm. that's all we got. But what we really need is a sensible infrastructure, a level three infrastructure, mm -hmm. that allows us to circumnavigate the island mm -hmm. freely and easily. A charge station every 30 miles would do it. We only need about 10 charge stations to, in the pilot program, and to get us going. And there's been a study done on this. NREL yeah. did a study for you? Will Rolston, yeah. Oh, great, for Will Royston, the energy coordinator for the county. That's right. Right, would you show us that map of where sure. the I have a couple of statistics. If okay, I could yeah, that. please, please tell us. So we were talking about yeah. the, the density of mm -hmm. infrastructure. Uh, Honolulu count, County uh, has a charge station for every three square miles mm -hmm. on Oahu. Maui, not quite as good, but still not bad. One charge station every 37 square miles. And the Big Island, one charge station every 300 square My miles. Goodness, orders of magnitude, 330, 300. Right. So what we really need is the strategic location of charge stations. Here's where they are right now. You can see they're all mm -hmm. along the Kohala coast and over in, in uh, uh, Hilo. What we need is mm -hmm. placement all along the Belt Road, mm -hmm every 30 miles and you have to take into account uh, geography because an electric vehicle going uphill is very different than going downhill. That's right. Right. So you can go from Waimea to Hilo but you can't go from Hilo to Waimea. Because it's downhill from Waimea but uphill That's right. That's right. going back. And we need them in strategic locations like a uh, volcano. If we were to um, uh, work with the ecotourism mm -hmm. segment that's a very, very popular national park. Mm. People would love to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not a big population. So if you were only to judge based on population density, mm -hmm. you would never put a charge station there. If you're looking at it as a destination mm -hmm. that, that tourists would go to, mm -hmm. then it makes a lot of sense to put one there. So there mm. seems to be two kinds of, two groups. One is the resident group where it's populated. 
those are the people that will buy EVs. The other are the routes, the destinations, and the routes that right. the tourists, the visitors travel on. If we and want the to, locals. And the locals. I would like to go. To <laughs> you also want to go. Right, right, right. But what we learned is that for the um, hospitality industry, the tourism industry, to adopt EVs, offer EVs for rent and all that, it has to be a complete infrastructure. Definitely the key destinations where tourists always go, the top three destinations, right. so to speak. Right. But those are not necessarily the most visited, the most traveled routes. Um, so if you had, were given only three DC fast chargers, only three, where would you put them on the Big Island? I want 10. You want 10? <laughs> OK. All right. <laughs> we're we're going to have to uh, explore this I'll with back our, off, but <laughs> it, at the end of our show when we have the round table um, and talk about just, you know, given the budget, given the constraints, what can we do? But let's end with um, the plug-in day so people will know about it. And this is very exciting because we're hoping that next year it will rotate to Kauai. Okay. Yeah, and because uh, Kauai has also got its issues, its challenges, right. but the Big Island seems to be for us the top priority. Good. So you could circumnavigate and actually have a meeting. Because <laughs> is, is that right? Your right. your your members cannot even physically I get think together. Of the seventy members, I've only met three. You've only met three face to face. Face to face of the seventy members. Oh, we can't get from one place to another, so we can't. We're a virtual community. All right. <laughs> Doug Teeple. Sorry, and you have let one me more? Just uh, point you to, uh, we have a website. Your website, yes. evhawaii.org. I still can't believe I got that domain. Go there. It's a lot of fun. It's a kind of record of our uh, uh, travels through uh, uh, trying to uh, own EVs on the Big Island. And if you would like to sign up, uh, send an email to leaf at evhawaii.org and we'll get you signed up. Wonderful. I've, I've signed up Great. Since, since we met and I love getting your, your emails, your blogs, all the wonderful people, wonderful stories. Right. Yeah, adventures. Thank you, Doug. Okay, here's my poster for Kona. Okay. And the poster for Hilo. Wonderful. It'd be great if people could come. Well, I would love to be there. I'll see. Probably not, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next, we're going to have uh, John Gartner uh, presenting his findings from Navigant Research Reports in Smart Transportation. Thank you, Doug. Thank and you. we'll be right back at the very end with a round table. Please, jo please, <laughs> please return. <laughs> your future through learning. With a Bachelor's of Applied Science degree, you'll be prepared for a career in the field of sustainable science management, engineering and technology, or applied business and information technology. Create sustainable communities. Engineer the next generation of technology. Develop the business expertise to succeed in a dynamic economic environment. Apply now at the University of Hawaii Maui College. Welcome back to Maui Eva TV. Next, we have John Gartner, G-A-R-T-N-E-R. -E John Gartner, Research Director of Smart Transportation at Navigant Research, and that's formerly Pike Research. John, welcome to our show. Thanks very much for having me. Were you at Pike Research before it became Navigant? Uh, yes, I started pretty much when the company started uh, a little more than four and a half years ago. And all this time in smart transportation? Yes, yes, and I was following clean energy and clean transportation for about a half a decade before that. Wow. So when you say smart transportation, what does that constitute? Well, it's anything that lowers the carbon footprint of transportation, reducing the amount of miles traveled, 
reducing direct emissions, anything that makes vehicles more energy efficient and cleans the air. Does that include plain old hybrids with no plugs? Yes, anything that reduces, even conventional combustion engine technology, such as turbocharging or adding small battery packs to things to make uh, stop-start vehicles, basically anything that makes uh, vehicles more efficient. And you're located in Colorado, but your research is not just in the U.S., is that correct? Correct, yes. We started off as a firm covering global markets, and we actually spend a lot of time sending our analysts, including myself, all over the world to talk to the buyers, sellers, and legislators, anyone involved in clean, the clean energy market. We go there in person, so several trips to Asia, Europe, Latin America, we go where the markets are. So with smart transportation, it's not just the vehicles, but also the charging stations as well? Yes, and it even includes things like public transit systems or things, infrastructure, ways that cities are developing. Uh, programs such as we just did a report on car sharing programs mm -hmm. which also ultimately does make the uh, environment better for everyone because it has people buying less cars using less raw materials and eventually driving less as well right and uh, I remember when you released the DC fast charging report yes. was that a comprehensive list of all DC fast charger manufacturers and network solution providers in the world Yes, we have several reports covering the charging world. Um, that one was specific to just DC charging, so we do have a directory of all the companies that we can find that manufacture the equipment. And then we also cover, cover the broader world of AC, sort of level one chargers, as well as a new technology for wireless charging. Wireless charging, my goodness. So what is the interest in Hawaii? Uh, how, I mean, and how does Hawaii compare with the rest of the world or rest of the US, what we're doing here? Sure. Yeah, well, we also look at uh, demand for electric vehicles and charging equipment on a state-by-state -state and a okay. major metropolitan area as well. Mm -hmm. So we have forecasts for all 50 states uh, as well as the major cities. And the good news for Hawaii is we've actually ranked it at the top in terms of projected penetration of plug-in electric vehicles for this year as well as for subsequent years. Uh, percentage of new EVs out of percentage of new cars, yes, new yes, vehicles. Uh, yes, for all the vehicles sold for the year, we think that for this, starting in this year, Hawaii will slightly overtake California, which much larger market, many more vehicles, but as a percentage of new vehicle su sales, we think that Hawaii will take the leadership position this year. Well, does that include trucks or just the... This is light duty vehicles. Light duty, so that's yeah. what, passenger... Passenger cars and light trucks and vans. Like SUVs as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. That's big news. Yes, yes. Well, you know, here in Hawaii, there's a lot of favorable conditions, and consumers here have shown a very strong interest. And now it's a matter of improving infrastructure, improving selection of vehicles for Hawaii to, to retain that leadership position. Right, right. Well, um, share with us some of the findings you okay. made. Um, yeah. So in studying the market in, uh, in Hawaii, we've really looked at uh, what are all the factors uh, mm -hmm. when trying to figure out, well, is this city or is this state going to be positive? Have they people by there had an affinity for hybrid vehicles in the past? Right. Do the people living there, do they fit the right demographic profile for age, education level, income? Are there resources to get the vehicles out on the road? How much has the, uh, have the automakers made it a priority to make vehicles available? What is the cost, most importantly, of fuel compared to electricity in the region? Right. Um, obviously, Hawaii scores very high in both those for high oil prices as well as high electricity prices. But high oil prices is a very strong indicator for interest in moving to electric vehicles since consumers there have the chance to save the most money by trading in your $70, $80 car fill-ups for mm -hmm. a few pennies equivalent on the gallon in electricity. Right, right. Yeah, we do have huge motivations for going electric. Um, just the gas, gas prices. It's like you watch it every day, it's changing. <laughs> it's the only direction is up, it seems. Yeah, yeah, there's been a history, and we've looked at the trends over time. For example, with hybrid vehicle sales, mm -hmm. which are kind of the closest equivalent, mm -hmm. uh, as pr gas prices go up in a region, then sales of hybrids go up. Wow. If the sales re retreat, then to a certain extent, hybrid sales will slow down a bit, mm -hmm. but that's definitely a strong indication. So again, why Hawaii is kind of 
a great testing ground for that. Of course, also concern about the environment is really important, mm. attitudes of consumers towards the environment. Mm -hmm. And people also want to know where are the electrons coming from. When I buy an electric vehicle, am I right. just moving the emissions from my car down the road to a power plant or not? Is it going to be using coal or natural gas? How will it potentially mess up the environment? And so I know there's progress being made on that front here in Hawaii that more resources are being dedicated towards putting wind and solar on the grid mm -hmm. for the cleanest possible driving. Yeah, our rationale is wind blows the hardest at night when we're sleeping. Right. That's when our cars are charging. So rather than dump that wind, you know, use it to charge our cars, our electric vehicles. Yeah, there's a great potential for that, not only in Hawaii, but all over the world. You know, there's a lot of projects studying that particular possibility in uh, Denmark and Germany when mm -hmm. there is a surplus. It costs electricity companies to get rid of that excess wind area. It, it, it uses uh, mm -hmm. the resources of the equipment itself, maintenance issues. So they're, they're paying to get rid of it. Wouldn't it be better to just put it in a car battery? And so timing electric vehicle charging to the overnight time, as you say, when wind is often in, a, in abundance, is really a great connection. It's a win for everybody because it saves electricity, overall mm -hmm. and it can really benefit the utilities who are always dealing with the intermittency of wind and solar. You know, they spend a lot of money, they use a lot of natural gas peaker plants to try and offset when the wind blows versus when it doesn't and when the sun comes out and electric vehicles with their battery packs can take a lot of that um, excess energy away and really help mm -hmm. make it more efficient all across the grid. Right, right. Um, so this trip, you, you arrived on Sunday, yes. Honolulu, and today's Friday. You're leaving on Friday. What have you learned that you could share with us? Yes. <laughs> Besides the fact that uh, people in Hawaii are incredibly welcoming and the weather's not too bad either, <laughs> uh, that there is a lot of passion for this topic here. Mm. Uh, it, it probably out, even out uh, numbers the sales of vehicles today. There's a lot of interest, a lot of people really wanting to make this work. And again, all these background measures of should or shouldn't it happen here, everything indicates positive. Now, no region is without its challenges, be they business challenges, availability of vehicles, things on the regulatory front, but there's the really a strong heart beating towards getting electric vehicles here and making it a success story and letting the rest of the world know that this is a place where it can happen and really be a showcase for the rest of the world as a major tourist destination. Wonderful. So are you coming out with another report about your findings about Hawaii? Uh, yes, we will put something on our website. I have a few ideas of a couple different blogs I will write about this trip. It's been wonderful, uh, very informative. I've seen a demonstration of the Smart Grid project here as well that has EVs charging off the grid to do some of those things we've talked about in terms of balancing the, the grid and, and looking at uh, a more affordable and cleaner way to improve the grid. Wonderful. And your website is navigantresearch.com? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Nat, so John, thank you very much. We're going to have Ethan Elkind from Berkeley Law School next. And then after that, we'll have a round table joined by Doug Teeple from the first segment. Right. and. Uh, this is John Gartner from Navigant Research, and be sure to visit your site for your blogs and summaries of your reports. Yes, right? navigantresearch.com. Navigantresearch.com, yes, and uh, we'll be right back after this. Nana mai ni o ko yamuse TV kapunai vele kiwi o kikula nui o Maui. Welcome back to Maui Eva. The last speaker today before our roundtable is Ethan Elkind, someone that I met uh, briefly in May last year and had the opportunity to work with in February and March when we visited the neighboring islands and again recently when we 
wrote a report together. Ethan Elkind, welcome to Maui Eva TV. Thank you, Anne. Thanks for having me. Now, you, we, had a, we had quite an adventure when we <laughs> went to all the neighbor islands in February, just for, just for seven days, mm -hmm. yeah? You landed, and I picked you up mm -hmm. from the airport. Then we went to Molokai for Saturday, Sunday. And then the next day, first thing in the morning, Kona drove over to Waimea to meet. Uh, we stopped by and met Doug Teeple, mm -hmm. uh, and then Hilo, and flew out of Hilo Tuesday and went to Oahu, and then Wednesday we were in Oahu, and then over to uh, Kauai, mm -hmm. and then uh, f uh, Friday we came right mm -hmm. back to Maui, and then then Saturday you left. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I was happy to be a part of it. You know, at, at Berkeley Law, we've been doing a lot of stakeholder outreach, uh, working on climate change policies. That's been my, uh, my main area of work. So I've been looking at uh, different business policies in particular. Mm -hmm. What are the business uh, sectors that we want to see grow and thrive in an era of climate change? And so we're happy to help and work with you on, uh, on your electric vehicle outreach to the neighboring islands. Now, these policy reports, how many have you written so far? Maybe we could take a look. Yeah, at so why don't I go through some of the, uh, the slides here. So uh, we've released uh, 11 policy reports to date, as I mentioned, all on the subject of climate change. And electric vehicles in particular, uh, we look at as a, a really critical piece of solving the climate change uh, challenge that we face globally. So when you, when you look at the forecast for greenhouse mm -hmm. gas emissions, we need to take, uh, take some serious steps to switch our transportation over to electrified sources of fuel away from transportation mm -hmm. fossil fuels. And we're going to have to do this pretty rapidly. And by 2050, that electricity supply is also going to have to be mostly renewable. Mm -hmm. So we basically need to electrify our transportation and make sure it comes from renewable sources for like the sun and the wind and geothermal, all of which Hawaii has a lot of and is in a good position to help us meet those goals. And one of the greatest challenges we heard at the uh, recent the uh, Asia Pacific Energy Clean Energy Summit in Honolulu was the integration of renewable sources into the grid. Mm -hmm. Seems like a really mm -hmm. really yeah. Absolutely. Big so challenge. so electric vehicles I think they help in so many ways. So yeah. as I mentioned they help electrify our transportation, but the battery uh, potent the battery co uh, component of electric vehicles is really important because as battery research uh, improves, as mm -hmm. the costs come down, we've already seen costs come down a lot. This provides a great opportunity to integrate those intermittent renewable resources. So uh, it's a dual purpose. Absolutely. Basically. So you may have cars plugged in that are mm -hmm. charging, and you can charge them at a variable rate mm -hmm. to coincide with the fluctuations in the sun and the wind. You also have the opportunity potentially for a second life for that battery. Once it's no longer usable in, in the car mm -hmm. application, they still have a lot of capacity left, and there's a lot of testing being done to see what could be what could be done with those batteries to put them on the grid, stack them, and use them as standalone energy storage to harness some of that that here in Maui, that surplus wind generation mm -hmm. at night that currently is being dumped. And I know in other islands too, uh, yeah. Big Island, we, we came across that situation. So a lot of potential there. Right. And I, what I find interesting is how you manage to you know, do these policy reports single-handedly. Uh, you, you find a topic, you, you research, yeah, and that's of interest, and then you locate the experts in the field, mm -hmm. and then you call them up, and then you organize a one-day workshop. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And we, and we work closely mm -hmm. with policymakers, uh, with Governor mm -hmm. Jerry Brown's administration, to figure out what are the key topics that California needs to address to meet those climate and energy goals that we have in the state. Uh, so, and we bring the people together for a one-day stakeholder meeting and then draft these reports. And, you know, our neighbor out, uh, island outreach was kind of similar to that. It wasn't a one-day, but we had a chance to talk to a diverse array of, of stakeholders. And I should also mention, you know, we do a lot of California work, so maybe people are wondering why would I you know, be coming right. out to Hawaii. Well, why are you today? interested in Hawaii? <laughs> well, and, and I mean, obviously, uh, personally, it's always great to come to Hawaii, and, and it's been great to work with you and, and Maui Eva. But, uh, but more importantly, uh, for our work and I think for the, for the future of our renewable energy and climate change goals globally, Hawaii presents an amazing opportunity, particularly with electric vehicles. And I say that because you have 8 million visitors a year that come to Hawaii. And if those visitors have a chance to rent an electric vehicle, charge it, get used to it, get comfortable with it, that is an, ex an incredible opportunity for an extended test drive and to showcase electric vehicles for that, those, you know, maybe even just a small fraction of those, of those 8 million, that's a huge opportunity to get the word out about electric vehicles. And so many people that we talk to who drive them, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about them, but they're always amazed with the performance, with the ease, the quality of the ride. 
So, you know, we think it's, this is a really important opportunity to get it right in Hawaii, and that's something that can be scaled to the rest of the world. Well, and I also think that in Hawaii we have different microclimates, so you can literally experience the hot, the tropical, or the rainy, mm -hmm. yeah, the cool, mm -hmm. um, all sorts of climates and all sorts of elevations, too. Mm -hmm. And um, we really believe that you do need the extended test drive, mm -hmm. not just the five-minute, one hour, but over several days. Yes. Right, not just driving, but charging as well. Mm -hmm. So do it on your vacation. Absolutely. Why not? <laughs> and you know, and it's, it's not just about serving the visitor industry, too. I mean, residents here will benefit tremendously. I mean, as anyone watching this from here in Hawaii knows, gas prices are, are some of the highest in the nation. Electricity prices are high, too, but a lot of people we talked to on our neighbor island outreach they have uh, rooftop solar, that's so right. that's that's a big tie-in. If you've got rooftop solar, you know most of those people are generating excess renewable energy that they can't financially mm -hmm. take advantage of. So the electric vehicles become a nice sink for that that surplus energy. So that is so some of the key challenges that we found on our trip related to that. That you've got to make sure that enough people have access mm -hmm. to rooftop PV to really enable them to get the financial benefits. And it serves the EV serves as a regulator mm -hmm. rather than you know use your air conditioning as a regulator of energy because people don't want to give back credit they've accumulated during the year mm -hmm. back to the utility so why not use it on your car yeah absolutely right? so absolutely yeah so let's talk about the, the report we actually sure. uh release this report yeah. at the asia yeah. pacific <laughs> Clean Energy Summit, and there are just few limited copies, but this is available on our website, MauiEva.org, mm -hmm. as a PDF, and also uh, I, I put the link to your website as well, the bigger version, the 5.5 megabyte, ours is 2.6 megabyte, you know, faster download. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this report, you know, after we did this trip, we realized we had the good fortune to talk to people on each island, each of the major populated islands in, in Hawaii. And we went without any expectation. Mm -hmm. We it, went to show our 105-page report to mm -hmm. the Department of Energy to talk about Maui, right? Mm -hmm. Not realizing they also wanted something like yes. Maui Eva where they are and, at. And, have, you know, to hear from the Maui experience, but also to see what the challenges are in each uh, specific island. So, you know, we decided it made sense to put this, capture it in a document that hopefully will be of use to the public, to mm -hmm. decision makers, business industry, et cetera. And so this report has island by island mm -hmm. uh, challenges for EV deployment and adoption and also uh, solutions too that we think might work. And, we, and of course we c cover an overview of the electric vehicle uh, situation here statewide. And it's the first report of its kind because all previous reports have been very sort of about the whole state from kind of and, and centralized on Honolulu mainly mm -hmm. and then Maui but not specifics about each yeah. island. And you know we visited some islands that don't get a lot of attention. No. Uh, I think Molokai is a, is a great example. It's an island that a lot of people might overlook but there's a real potential there and uh, we well, talked about that. Well I was report. surprised that there were that many EV owners. Mm -hmm. There's now seven at least? I, I think, think there's eight now. Eight now? Yeah. Oh you just discovered yeah. another one. Yeah. <laughs> and this is without a lot of a lot of support on the island. You know there's yeah. no, no public charging stations on the island. But, you know, like all the islands in Hawaii, a few charging stations can make a huge difference to increasing range. But uh, for the all not battery. just anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got to be in the right spots. Right. And spots. this is something that we've learned. Uh, so, you know, there was an initial wave of stimulus money that went into to fund charging mm -hmm. stations, which is great. It really, it really helped, you know, get a nice uh, uh, sort of toehold for electric mm -hmm. vehicle infrastructure. But we, we do need to put more in and in the right places. We want to make sure that we're not putting fast chargers, for example, mm -hmm. in downtown areas where you have, people have to wait for an hour to line up to get your half hour charge. Mm. And people are probably going to be parking for a couple hours anyway, so level two might make sense. So we, we need to really get that right, analyze the traffic patterns. But you know, I have to say, a lot of these islands in Hawaii, it's just not rocket science where to put them. Like on Molokai, for example, you put one on the west end, put it on the east end, you know, you've solved the range issue. You know, it's always great to have more, but at a very basic minimal level, you solved it. You know, I think uh, Doug uh, talked as well, you know, yeah. about the, the need for a few key spots in, on the big island, and it's, it's similar across the islands. Well, in general, do you need one at the airport? Well, airport, you know, the, people are parked for a long time generally at the mm -hmm. airport, so it's great to have them there, but, mm -hmm. you know, that's, again, not a place where you need a fast charge. You know, you may not even need a level two as long as you provide the basic level one outlets for people if they're going away on vacation. That's it's the probably thing. Sufficient. A lot of people aren't aware that a level one will do. Mm -hmm. yeah. A great example. So last night, you know, we're here traveling mm -hmm. and uh, at our hotel. They didn't have a level two charger at the hotel, but a wall outlet was fine. I, you know, I got in uh, after dinner at 9. We left today at 9. It was basically a full charge. Excellent. We didn't 
doesn't need any special equipment or anything. And most people, charging at home is fine for their, for their average needs. For their average needs, right. But for the visitor, the tourist, uh, unless they can charge at the hotel, right, if they were to go to a destination, they would need some kind of fast charge. Yes. Yes. Right. Or, or level two, or level where you can two. charge it in two to four hours if it's at a spot like the beach or maybe. Where they're going to be there for a while. Exactly. Right. Like yeah. a restaurant yes. or a Shop, Yeah, shopping, shopping, restaurant, beach, uh, maybe some sort of hike, you know, uh, interpretive hike, something like that, that, yeah. uh, that they would be there for a while. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit with um, uh, Jim in, the, uh, in one of our earlier episodes. Um, you know, the right level of charging for the right location. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. What were the other major findings from our report? Well, I can go through uh, some of our, uh, our our slides here and show you. So the key barriers is definitely this charging infrastructure issue, the PV issue that I mentioned as well, and also a generalized. You know, people are still learning about electric vehicles. So you know, again, our, our hotel is another example. You know, when I got up there, uh, we asked them to plug it in, and the first night they never did. Um, you know, you, there's all sorts of challenges where businesses just aren't aware. They've got their business model. You know, EVs are not something that that they really grew kind of uh, successful doing, mm -hmm. so it's hard to get the bandwidth and people to really focus on it. And among the public, the same thing, a lot of misconceptions. You also may have situations where, you know, car dealers like on the Big Island, you know, are not uh, promoting them. So there's those kind of challenges as well. Uh, and I have a map here of the current charging locations. You can see the gold of the fast chargers. So you can see they're concentrated, you know, Oahu and, and Maui, but uh, and one in, Ka in uh, Kauai, but we need to get them in other, other this islands. This is well. on PlugShare. And, and yes, PlugShare.com. Free app, and also the state has a free mobile app as well. And we've got a nice screenshot of that mobile app in right, the, in the so report. Right, so check out our report. Yeah, <laughs> so some solutions, because, you know, we don't want to just focus on barriers. It's easy to do that. But as we were talking about really planning and, and promoting those, those charging infrastructure, your sites and a, and a big part of it is it's a real on the ground nuts and bolts kind of thing who's going to host that charging station who's going to pay for the electricity y let's say you can find some grant money to pay for the equipment who's going to pay to trench the lines and, and do, right. all that, do all that kind of prep who's going to maintain it so you know it's you got to you got to get with the business community find that property host uh, host site owner uh, and figure out how, what's the revenue potential there if you're going to have increased traffic people charging so uh, we talked about that. Um, we talked about the need for utility policies to really help work with people to get rooftop right. PV. And I know the utilities here are, are, are making good progress in that, but we, in that respect, but we still have more to go to really make sure that we can, everyone has access to rooftop PVs. Uh, and then the last thing is just you know, generalized promotion of electric vehicles. You know, if you if you are watching and you believe in electric vehicles, get out there and and uh, talk. Yeah, to I really think the evangelists are all those EV owners. Mm -hmm. um, what was the dealership? They said that for every uh, EV that gets sold, uh, five people go in afterwards to ask about it. They're yeah. related to the, the customer. Well, in San Diego somehow. Gas and Electric, I think they did a study where, of leaf, leaf owners, and, uh, and they, they found them clustered in certain neighborhoods. Yeah, somebody was driving into, and, you know, down the street and pulling into their garage, all the neighbors say, what, yeah. what are you driving? I want to check that out. Absolutely. So, Ethan, seems like we got a lot to discuss with our other speakers, too, in our roundtable. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about all these, all these things that we've heard. <laughs> I'm just getting too excited about that. But, Ethan, thank you very much. And this report is available on our MAUIVA website. Um, just go to MAUIVA.org and you can download the 36-page PDF, no problem. And we'll be right back for the roundtable. Welcome back to Maui Eva, this last segment of today's episode. Very pleased to have a round table of the earlier speakers, the guest speakers from the Big Island, from Colorado, and from California. Let's go through them again. Doug Teeple, founder and president of Big Island EV Association and a leaf driver yourself. Welcome yes. back. Thank you. And John Gartner, research director of smart transportation at Navigant Research in Colorado. Welcome back. Yep. And Ethan Elkind, policy, wait, climate change policy associate at UC Berkeley Law School. Did I get that right? You did. Good job. Also Thank affiliated you. with UCLA as well. Yes. Yeah. All right. 
This roundtable, we're just going to discuss a lot of the issues that have come up, some of the questions that were asked. And um, I just was also want to mention that on this trip, um, both of you arrived Sunday and then uh, on Wednesday uh, to Honolulu, and then on Wednesday you went to Molokai, and we came back to Maui, and then you arrived on Thursday from the Big Island. Uh, we were all driving Leafs, yeah? Yeah. So True. we got to experience what it was like. And then you stayed in hotels, and you had to charge the Leafs overnight, experience what it's like. What do you think the education level is, or the training needs are of the staff, rental and at the hotel? And, or rather, let's, let's put it this way, the awareness that the car you were driving and needed a charge was a leaf and was different from any other car. Well, we, uh, you know, just funny you ask because even just uh, this morning, we were staying at a hotel in Maui and they, uh, they had charged it overnight. Of course, the first night they uh, said they were going to charge it, but they didn't. But uh, we had to wait a half an hour because they were there in the garage trying to yank out the cord. Yank out the cord. Without realizing that the lock button had been pushed on the newer Leafs. There's a, a lock button so people can't just accidentally pull the cord out. And so they were struggling. This is the 2013 Leaf. It's very different from the 2012 mm -hmm. and 2011 Leafs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's a new thing. I mean, in a lot of ways, EV drivers are pioneers to some extent. And, you know, you're dealing with industries, as I mentioned in our, our talk, that, you know, they're really focused on the kind of their main business line. And EVs are still, you know, somewhat of a niche thing. Although I think, you know, as John's study points out and as the data shows, I mean, it, it's increasing. But I think if you, if you buy an EV, you're going to be an ambassador. Right. Uh, to educate a lot of people, I'm sure, Doug, you have a lot of stories on the Big Island. Yeah, well, some of us enjoy living on the edge of range fright. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if you own a, any car for any length of time, you get a feeling for, you know, what it's like, how, what your range is, how many bars is it going to take to get up that hill, right, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So you get used to it, like any car. But mm -hmm. it takes a while. I mean, I... It took me quite a while to get over my range anxiety, and I have to say it's probably because I don't know... A geography of the area, I, you know, I, I don't travel that much, and also um, spatially challenged. You know, when you say it's one mile, well, what does that mean? Yeah, I'm not a good driver, so yeah. yeah. Well, luckily you have a GPS system. Certainly, the Leaf comes with a GPS, so you can look at what it's telling you. Now, that's imprecise because, as you mentioned, Doug, hills matter a lot. Going that's up, going right. down, um, the ar the in number indicated th is, is just an estimate, so you have to be a little bit conservative. But I found uh, in my first lengthy experience driving a Leaf that I adjusted pretty quickly, and I was just more cognizant of mm -hmm. what I had to do and ha what I had to pay attention. But it didn't really limit me. I was able to go where I needed to go, and yeah, I could have had a little bit extra juice to make it more comfortably. But by making sure I wasn't running the air air conditioning high at all times and watching how I was stopping and starting and driving, you can certainly uh, maximize your efficiency pretty mm -hmm. easily if you're ever sort of on that, on that edge. So, and, and as I said, it was my first prolonged experience and you, you learn pretty quickly once you get a, get a feel for the vehicle. I, I, think, I think this points to your, your initial question about the awareness level. And mm -hmm. I think there is a little bit of a learning curve when you first drive a LEAF. And I think you know, for businesses that want to get involved and maybe renting a leaf or you know working with customers that are driving leaves i mean there is a, a bit of a training that has to has to be a part of that so you mentioned uh, the renting an ev mm -hmm. uh, i remember when we first uh, got to oahu and honolulu you know you go to the enterprise and it's great they're renting a leaf but you know it's not necessarily the case that their staff is going to know exactly what to tell people and you know you, you kind of almost need someone to sit there in the car with you just it doesn't take forever it's just not you know, I mean, if you know how to drive, you're fine, but there are a couple little features. You know, putting it in eco mode when you're driving can give you more range. Knowing the impact of running the AC and the radio on your range. Uh, you know, those are just basic tips, but you ha that has to be built into well, the corporate culture. Well, here's the thing. When you are in the rental car business, right, any car is almost the same. You don't have to spend time with the customer, right? You don't have to spend time saying, oh, are you sure you want this car? Right? Where are you going? Right? But with an EV, you have to. You have to make sure you've got your fobs. You make sure you don't get stranded. In many ways, it's, it's a lot of work compared to a gas car. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of education yet to be done, even for people who are selling or renting or yeah. supposedly working at things like hotels. I think one important thing is to 
uh, assume that if you, somebody you know, nods yes, oh yeah, I know what you mean, I wouldn't take that for granted because a lot of times they just don't want to admit that they may not know exactly what you're talking That's about. That's true, yeah. uh, So being as explicit as possible and, and ex maybe doing a little bit of explanation along with the question you're asking to make sure that you do get a, an honest, completely forthright answer helps. It's tough for these organizations, as I said, for right now, I mean, EVs are still kind of the other. They're that thing that's new, and if you're used to learning certain things about vehicles and how they're refueled, um, it's going to take a while for that to filter down, certainly across a staff, right? Mm -hmm. When you've got dozens or hundreds of employees, mm -hmm. even if management knows the issues, then that information isn't really going to filter mm -hmm. down um, really quickly to everybody who needs to know. So I think don't make assumptions and, and try and be helpful and doing a little bit of explaining along the way just to make sure you're, you're getting a true answer. Well, also practice, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the point of training if you don't get to use it right away? Mm -hmm. Or if it's just once in a blue moon, you, you handle a leaf, right? It has mm -hmm. to be, you know, or, or a vol or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a new technology. You know, I mean, any of us who, you know, first time using a, a, a smartphone, you know, you're not just going to know how to do things. You know, usually there's kind of you friends, other people, maybe people in the store to, to show it to you. You know, I'm sure when the first horse and buggy drivers got, a, you know, got their Model T or whatever the first car was, they, there was some training about how to use that. It's a new technology, there's a lot of conveniences, but there is a bit of a learning curve. And, uh, and it's not, you know, not just the drivers, but, you know, when you go to a parking garage, they need to know where the EV parking spot is and, you know, help you get that set up, and so there, there's a lot and of And speaking kind of, of smartphones things. or any electronic device in general, I mean, at airports, you see it, everyone's looking for an outlet to plug their phone in or their laptop or iPad in, right? And, uh, uh, like, but for us, if you're driving an EV and you need to charge, you could also plug it in, but typically you have to ask. Right, you can't just plug it in. It's almost like this. It's called property rights. This doesn't belong to you. It's an outlet. But if it's a phone, it's okay. You don't have to ask. Why do you have to ask if it's a car? Right. Well, the amount of energy used is a lot higher, obviously, yeah. in a vehicle, and it may be there for several hours as opposed to a 10-minute charge when you're getting a coffee or something like that. But I think your point is is correct in that. Um, I think it should get to the point where you don't need to ask where things should be ubiquitous and it should be a friendly environment mm -hmm. to take advantage of that because uh, in many cases, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the need for charging equipment and infrastructure, but the reality is, you know, if you're going over to a friend's house and they've got a garage, just say, oh, would you mind if I just plugged in for the time I'm here? Because it, it really doesn't cost a lot in terms of dollars. It's a matter of cents in most cases mm -hmm. or, you know, low dollars at best. But the culture just has to sort of understand that that's okay. It's normal. It's it's not much more than than the other types of scenarios you're talking about. Because mm -hmm. uh, I know when I first started doing this research, and people were saying, "Oh, range anxiety," and there's not enough places to plug in. But when you really think about it, you know, the, the assumption of, "Oh, I only wish electricity was as ubiquitous as gasoline." <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's absurd when you look at it in that way. Yeah, you may not have like pull up to the curb right there, charging stations with all the yeah. bells and whistles. But the reality is, electricity is anywhere in a developed region. You can find something to help you out. There's an outlet everywhere. That's true. And the real charger is on your car, on your electric vehicle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And we, we, we talk about charging station as if it's a big tank. <laughs> you know, maybe for DC fast chargers is, it is, but it's not this big humongous refrigerator or whatever thing. Um, so curious um, on the big island, because I would love for our, um, our EV owners on Maui um, to be as active as the Big Island EV Association. I mean, we, we meet a lot more frequently than you all do. Um, well, we've actually never met. You've never met. <laughs> okay. All right. The island's big, so it's hard to get everybody <laughs> But together. I get a lot of your emails, so I just We're assume. We're a virtual organization. I assume you all meet all the time. I mean, this is dialogue. three of the seven people. Just three of the seven <laughs> people. Until you get more charging stations, some of you can't <laughs> physically. <laughs> Amazing. No. Yeah. It, it comes from... Uh, First of all, the need. I mean, we have you we have, have a, a real need, need, right? Yeah, a real big and, need. Uh, secondly, there, there's a lot of activity on it, and it's very interesting kind of stuff. And thirdly, I pop my business card in the window of every <laughs> leaf that I see, and I get people to join. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. And those that are not in your association, probably you haven't seen their leaves or haven't seen their vaults. That's why they don't know about you. Uh, there's a few left, uh, yeah. not many. A few left. <laughs>
But I think it is a great model. I, I talk about what you, the work that you've done in organizing all these owners. I think it is really a, a great example for other communities. And the neat thing is seeing that you know you're the ones. I mean, it's fallen on you to push for the charging infrastructure. I mean, you'd think that there would be other entities out there, you know, money making for profit businesses that would see something there. But I mean, I think this shows that there's a bit of a market failure in some ways, and that you're stepping in to lead that effort. But I, I think it shows how you know residents need to push for this stuff, and the owners themselves need to push for it. Uh, you know, we had talked about the visitors benefiting, but uh, you know, I think it has to be that sort of uh, you know the local local push. So it's been great to. I mean, I'm, I'm on your email list too. Just uh, it's fun <laughs> to see the conversation. It goes from bare you know bare bones. This charging station's out, and how do we swipe this? To, you know, let's get a charging station in this spot. Pictorial gar guide to charging at Kona Airport. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, marketing studies have shown the greatest spokespeople for a, for a product are the owners of that, mm. and, and especially if it's someone you know or you've met or who's talking conversationally about their experience much more than any marketing campaign from an automaker or a local civic association or something like that. I mean, the conversations that you have with people you meet when you're out and about and, and just saying it's it's a positive, talk about all the, the realistic expectations you have in, in working with an EV. That's where change can happen. Um, yes, it's important for things at the higher level, mm -hmm. messages to commu be communicated, but if you can talk with everybody who's in and around the industry on an informal basis, be they involved in solar or, or working at car rental agencies, whatever, that can really have a dramatic effect because people will, will believe you, first of all, because they don't really feel like they're being marketed to if mm -hmm. you're really speaking from your heart and from mm -hmm. your experience. I think there's also a, a, a kind of a friendly competition thing too, maybe a status competition. We certainly saw that in the solar industry. You know, and your neighbor gets uh, rooftop solar. You know, maybe it's just coming from California, where you know it's, it's kind of a race <laughs> to be the most eco-conscious. But you know, that you start to see it proliferate when people see their neighbors do it. Uh, and I think you know, I was mentioning, you know, when the neighbor gets a leaf, you know, people will start to take notice. And I mean, it's, it's one of the advantages that EVs have uh, maybe compared to things like energy efficiency, whereas if you re-insulate your house or put in new energy efficient appliances, nobody can see that, so you don't get the sort of social status mm. benefit. But EVs, you know, it's a fun ride and you get to be cool to your uh, Well, to your I think neighbors. also if you talk about the savings, the savings on gas, the savings on, you know, then people really see it. And I think there was a study somewhere about energy efficiency. Definitely, it's what your na knowing what your neighbor pays, if it's less than you, then you think, well, why not me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So this cluster effect has two implications. One is that, you know, this word of mouth will spread. Yeah. I mean, we see that on campus already. If one person in one department gets one, then the another one in the same department gets another, another EV. But I think also um, on the grid, you'll see distribution circuits, I think, you know, uh, a lot of them charge at the same time in that circuit. Right, that's true. Yeah, we found that out in our early research when we first did our study on the impact of EVs going on the grid in 2009 mm -hmm. was that, I mean, overall, are there enough generation assets, enough power plants to handle EVs? Mm. Yes. Right. That's for sure. On, on an aggregate level, no problem. And even, you know, obviously we want to retire some of those uh, power plants and replace them with wind and solar, and that will happen. But the real potential impact could be at that micro level, the neighborhood, a... But uh, a, a neighborhood of cul-de-sac streets where you start seeing two, three, four, five EVs mm -hmm. show up. The transformers, in many cases, if they were built before the 1980s, mm -hmm. they were not built for swimming pools and heat pumps and, and air, central air and, and now EVs. And so there can be really be a strain on a on basically a block by block basis that the utilities are going to have to cope with. And I just want to uh, wrap this up by saying thank you very much and um, We've got all everyone's websites, evhawaii.org, one word, right? I still can't believe I got that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got information on National Plug-in Day as well in yeah. Kona and Hilo. And navigantresearch.com and then Berkeley Law School. Well, that's linked from our website, mm -hmm. mauieva.org, where you could download this copy of the report, PDF. Um, lots of end notes, lots of pictures, lots of stories and barrier, barriers and solutions. Also, our 105-page report um, to the Department of Energy, all about Maui, Maui. And we also have a weekly column, uh, uh, sorry, a monthly column in Maui Weekly called EV in Paradise. Um, the, the last one was about this report, actually, and the previous one on chicken, chicken or the egg. And 
please visit us on MauiEva.org, where you'll also see links to the YouTube channel of previous episodes. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.